So welcome everyone to our talk, Leveraging AI for Smarter Bug Bounties. Um, first of all, thank you to DEF CON and the Bug Bounty Village for giving us this space to discuss how AIs can improve the, and change the security field and the bug bounty space. And we're going to be discussing how AIs can improve our daily job and help us work on what we want and also let the AI take care of other stuff. So his name is Diego Jurado, I'm Joel Noguera. Uh, we are both security researchers at Expo. Uh, for those that doesn't know us, we have been quite a while in the bug bounty uh, scene. And apart from that, we have been also working for several years in very in some of well-known uh, companies in the security industry as security researchers and pen testers. So let's start from the very beginning. Um, when we started this three months ago, um, we started looking that there are many, uh, in the recent years we have seen like a lot of research being published about people hacking AIs, right? Like people doing research about publishing how to force the AI to do unexpected things, to leak information, etc. However, there is one particular realm that remains unclear uh, regarding AIs and is how AIs could be used in a more offensive way. In other words, would be the AI hacking for us and taking care of some stuff that we could do. Um, so we have been just, we started three months ago and we don't know where the limit is for this technology, but we wanted to show you one quick example of, of the things that an AI agent could do on our field. So first of all, we are going to be talking about different questions, interesting questions that we uh, have been um, encountered while doing this journey. And this is one of the first one, and it's how can I ask mimic human bounty hunters? But in order to understand what a bounty hunter, what human bounty hunter means, we need to first understand what they, it is, right, for us. So humans have several skills and capabilities that we hardly seen on the tools that we use in our daily job. And some of them are intuition, creativity, uh, decision making based on the experience that we have collected before. For example, if we learn something doing bounties, this is something that we are going to apply in the future to keep improving and getting better results. So let's try to answer this question with the demo. In this case, uh, we are going to see uh, our agent exploiting a JWT Python implementation for this particular CBE. Um, during the video, you are going to see the AI interacting with the web application, performing executing commands, processing the outputs, taking decisions, and creating goals and learnings based on what it sees and learns during the process. All what it takes for this is just a small description or goal and the target that we want to test. So I'm going to pause a little bit here just to show you a little bit the interface because it's the first time you are seeing this. So on the first part, you're going to see what we, got, what we give to the AI, just that we want to exploit that CVE and the target. Then you can see the the things that the AI is processing, analyzing, and the decisions and learning that is uh, taking. Then you can see the commands and the output and the goals that the AI is generating all by itself. We have no influence on that. So first of all, let's start with the basic uh, recon and recognize that there is a register endpoint. So it decides to attempt to register uh, an, an user. And in this case, it tries to use a content type JSON, which is grown and expected for the website. So learns that based on the response and decides to change that to use the correct content type. In this case, register a new user. And here on the bottom, you can see that the, the agent is logging in and saving the cookies on, on a cookie jar to use it later during the whole thing. Once logged in, it detects on the response that it has a JWT token. So immediately binds this to the goal that we have provided and decides to go to the internet to look for some public information and public exploits. Try NIST and GitHub, and in GitHub it finds one match that is a possible proof of concept, so it decides to download the proof of concept, and you can see that it's going to spot, no, it's going to cut the readme file. This is something that we always do, right? We want to understand how the, this exploit works, and we need to learn how to use it. So it's going to try to grab the token, and 
I'm running the exploit, but it makes a mistake. It's running in an incorrect path. Who hasn't been there, right? Like running an incorrect path for an exploit. So now that it learns, we define where it is, it runs again everything, and it finds that there is one missing dependency. So it goes ahead and installs the dependency and run again the exploit, changing the claim username to admin. This is a small detail that we're going to talk later. Then it starts trying to uh, the different payloads that it's getting from the exploit against the whole application, changing from login to registration to see where this exploit works or not. And at some point, this work on the root page. So there, the AI realizes that this has been logged as the admin user and successfully retrieved the flag from the challenge that we have proposed. So, thank you. So during the, this video, we have seen some of the things that we mentioned before about humans and tools that we use every day. We have seen some creativity, learning from mistakes, like identifying the incorrect path and, and taking a, a decision to decide where to execute the exploit. But most important, we have seen the capability of the AI to adapt into different situations. We have seen the AI registering a user, changing the content type to adapt to what the application expects, using the credentials that just created, and then uh, interacting with authenticating endpoints based on all the things that have learned. And something that really is interesting is, for example, things that we do like cutting the readme for an exploit, reading the Python code to understand how it works. There are probably simple things for us, but when we talk about something that is going on all by itself and it's reading the code and understanding the input, the output, and also the claims that they need to modify from the JWT token, it's super interesting. And most interesting probably is that if you are familiar with DCB, there is no nuclear template for this. And if you wonder why, it's probably because you first need a valid token, which would mean you have to register, sign in, and retrieve that token. Automating, automatizing that for every existing application on the internet would be quite a challenge. In this case, the AI takes care of all that and make progress on that goal. So in order to understand how we got here, we have to first understand where we were three months ago when we started. We started looking for uh, different uh, papers, white papers that were trying to use agents as in a more offensive way. We find a few of them, not many, but when we start looking at the results, we, uh, oh sorry, um, and they all have different, pro um, different approaches. One super common was the human in the loop, that is the human providing real time feedback to the AI in order to improve the results. Other have full automated agents, like the one you are seeing. Other have super specific agents where they were at, in, in charge of different tasks. And some of them were trying to exploit known vulnerabilities or other type of CTF challenges. When we start looking at the results, for example, for this paper, actually the, one of the authors of this paper, Brendan Dolangavit, is one of our colleagues at Expo. Uh, on this paper, they were trying to use LM agents to solve CTF challenges. If you see in the categories, they attempt to work with all of them, but they probably if we pay attention to the web one, which is the probably most interesting for us as bounty hunters, the results are not that promising, right? It's 16% just for one model. So we keep digging into the different um, papers, and we found Another one with, with, uh, that had more promising results. In this case, they were trying to use LLM agents to exploit one-day vulnerabilities. Uh, when we look there, we see an 87%, and that's quite exciting and promising. But when we start reading the results and the details, we see that if you remove the CV description that you provide to the model, that 87% drops dramatically to a 7%. So again, the results weren't that promising in this case. So as a conclusion from the state of art, uh, the results weren't good at all uh, for models at three months ago. Uh, all the cases weren't complex enough. For example, they were based on particular cases like the exploit being just one, two lines, or just requiring two requests to successfully exploit it. And, once, and something that they have in common is that they were all limited. Uh, for example, this last paper only had 15 CVEs on their paper. So when you try to scale this to the real world, you don't know how it's, this is going to be expanded, right? 
So we wanted to change things and scale things up. OK. Um, so now let's talk about the, the approach that we had at Expo. Uh, as Joel was saying, uh, we wanted to scale things up. So the first th thing that we did was starting collecting thousands of benchmarks from different CTF um, competitions. Um, we also partnered with some companies that you may know, like Paul Schwieger and Pendester Lab. So they provided to us all the exercises that they have online, and we added to our benchmarks. Also, um, we, we wanted to collect the most interesting and realistic challenges that we can find, and of course, with a great focus in web applications. Um, also, apart from that, we had to categorize all the challenges um, the, depending on the level of difficulty from easy to hard. And we also, something well, really important for us, we created a fully autonomous agent, uh, which is connected to um, an attack machine. And this attack machine uh, not only contains a lot of pen testing tools, but we also added some tools that we use uh, on our daily basis for back bounty, as we have a lot of experience using them. Um, and apart from that, uh, one thing that is also very important, um, we wanted to, to analyze the performance of our solver. So for that, we created an exclusive set of uh, more than 100 novel benchmarks. These benchmarks are used for validation. And as we are completely sure that the solution is not part of any uh, training data set, um, we can also evaluate uh, how the, the AI is performing. And here are the results that we got after three months of work. Uh, as you can see, Expo was able to solve 75% of uh, the challenges from Porswiga Labs, uh, 72 uh, of the challenges from Pentester Lab, and all of that without any human interaction. So all the exercises that we were able to solve were completely um, solved by the AI. Also something really important, uh, talking again about the novel benchmarks, um, we were able to solve 85% of those. We try to create the, these challenges as more representative as possible, and now we are going to see uh, how these challenges were created. So here you have a, a tree map uh, with a distribution of some vulnerabilities that we added to our benchmarks. Uh, as you can see, we try to be um, as more realistic as possible, trying to follow a, a distribution similar to what we see in back bounties. Um, so you can see here that we have uh, cross-site scripting and IDORs, which uh, probably are, are one of the most common issues and vulnerabilities that we see when doing back bounties and especially in life hacking events. But we also have some vulnerabilities like uh, server-side request forgery, common injections, privilege escalation, and also some CVs. So we try to follow a, a very good distribution to cover all the areas and all the vulnerability types. Uh, also, just in case someone is interested, um, we are going to share all the benchmarks that we have. So we are planning to, to publish them in a, in a few weeks, just in case you want to test them uh, against your own uh, agents. So just keep an eye to our social media and website as we will be sharing those over there. And here we have uh, some statistics about um, the, um, the success rate that we have depending on the category. We try to follow a similar category to what we have in OWASP, which is a reference for all of us that we are doing uh, web pen testing. And as you can see here, for some kind of categories, the AI was performing better than, than others. So let's say, for example, for broken authentication, we can see that uh, Oath and SAML were performing not that well than in other examples. This is something that we will be talking later, but we, we are trying to, to increase this success rate. Uh, but for example, for broken authentication, we have a uh, very good success. And again, we are filling in CSRF tokens, uh, in CSRF um, uh, issues. And we have some examples of injection vulnerabilities, which of course you all may know. Again, we are failing in DAMX SS. Uh, this is basically because at the beginning when we started doing um, our agent, we were missing like uh, an embedded browser. So uh, the, the agent was not able to exploit some issues that requires exploiting something in the browser or in client side. So this is something that we have improved now. And I think Joel, we will be talking later about this. Um, and then finally, some misconfiguration issues that um, as you can see here in cache poisoning and course is something that we still need to improve. I was really impressed about the blind XCC because it's not something really easy and we had like a very uh, success rate. And then talking about the success versus difficulty, uh, we can see that we perform really well uh, for easy and medium uh, vulnerabilities. We have almost 90% uh, from um, all the benchmarks that we are talking now. Just to clarify, these, uh, these statistics 
belongs to Porsweger, Pentester Lab, and um, our own validation challenges. We also have some other benchmarks that we use for training and that all, but here uh, we are only including uh, those three that we were talking before. And then for um, hard uh, vulnerabilities, we, we can see that we have 40%. Uh, so yeah, of course, we are going to try to improve that. And now um, here you can see some examples about some vulnerability types that you, you, can, you can see there. And we have one question for all of you. So for those examples that you can see here, um, I would like to ask you if you think that there is any case that the AI was not able to solve. So somebody has any idea? Any number? Any number? I, I will give you some seconds to, so that you can read all of them. Which one? Seven. Seven? OK, yeah. So uh, this was a tricky question, because in the end, uh, the AI was able to solve all of them. Um, <laughs> you can see that in our website, we have already shared some of those examples. For example, the Node.js one, the, the first one, the IDOR. But now we don't have uh, time to, to see all of them. But we want to, let, to show you uh, three of them. So we are going to start with uh, the re reflected XSS. So for the people that like exploiting this issue, you will like this, this example. In this example, the goal is to exploit an XSS. Um, we have some, uh, some sort of several filtering in place. So you will see the agent trying to uh, train some default payloads. Then you will see that it tries to use some kind of encodings. And finally, after realizing uh, how is the way to exploit that, he managed to exploit it using uh, HTML entity encoding. So let's go to the example. Yeah, let me update this. OK, so here you have uh, an example of our agent uh, working. So this is basically how it looks when we try to um, provide a, a challenge with a description. And we just say, OK, go ahead and hack it. Uh, so let's go up to see, uh, to the very beginning, what we have. As Joel was mentioning um, before, we have the description of the challenge. In this case, we are only providing the goal to execute an XSS with uh, the string XSS in capital letters. And we have also information about the target that we want to exploit. So if we go uh, a bit down, you can see that uh, first it starts accessing to the web application. It finds an endpoint, which is XSS 20, um, and then uh, realizes that there is a potential vulnerable parameter. So now it starts uh, uh, trying with a typical payload. And it realizes that uh, it fails because it's getting a 405 error. This is because it's trying to perform a post request. If we go a bit up to the previous output, you can see that there is a form which has no action. So first, it will try it with, um, with a post request and then realizes that it's doing bad and changes to get and tries again with the same payload. So if we go uh, a bit down, we can see that the first thing that the AI does is identify that there is one character which is being blocked. So this, this is something really important, especially when we want to phase, um, for example, by passing a WAF or something like that. We want to know what characters have been filtered. So this is something that the, the agent is realizing by itself and is really, really interesting. Then here, something that is, is really important, it fails while, while trying to craft um, uh, a request with a space. So it realizes that the, the current request is bad form. So then changes, tries to encode the payload and tries again, which is something that maybe we can, we can uh, see when we are trying to do uh, a bounty. And then let's see, um, let's go a bit down. Here you can see that after trying a couple of payloads, um, it realizes that it's not able to find a good solution, so it tries to change from context. At this point, tries to analyze again the application, but then it sees that there is nothing interesting apart from that. So again, gets the, the initial goal to exploit the XSS and goes again to try and exploit with different payloads. Again, if we go a bit down, we can see that um, again changes from, from the initial goal and, and tr start trying to see if it, it can fast the application, trying to do some brute force and trying to see if it can find any additional endpoint that might be vulnerable. Again, it says, okay, uh, this is not the way to go, so start again with another payload. And there's one point when it realizes that um, he's able to bypass the filters by using HTML entity encoding with JavaScript uh, string manipulation, and then after a few attempts, it managed to get a payload that is working. You can see all the, the encoded output. And if we go to the response, we can see the alert and the flag of the challenge who has uh, been retrieved. So yeah, that was the first example.
Thank you. If we go to the next one, here we have um, an image uploader vulnerability. Uh, we know that we have some extensions that are being filtered by the application. So one thing that is really interesting in this example is that um, Expo has to deal with some CSRF token and session cookies. You will see that it struggles with that because it's something that we have to do manually. Um, so after that, he managed to log in, in the application, then tries to upload a PHP web shell, uh, plays again with some extensions until it finally exploited by uh, uploading an HT access file. So let's go to the next example. Um, yeah. So yeah, let me update this one. Okay. So here in this case, you can see, um, yeah, again, the, the trace working. Um, we can see that in this description, with this, which is a challenge from Porswiger, we have a, a very detailed description. So the first thing that says is that we have to exploit again an image upload uh, function. It says that in this case, the goal is to exploit and retrieve the content of the, of the secret, which is inside the server. And then also provide some credentials that you can use for authenticate. So the agent will take all this information and from that point will start working. So if we go a bit down, you can see again that it starts to access to the application. It sees that there is some redirect, so it follows that. And then tries to use uh, the credentials to authenticate that were provided in the description. At this point, it sees that it's missing a, a CSRF parameter. So in these old comments that I'm going to scroll again, um, it will start to understand how the CSRF token works, how it has to deal with, with that part, which is new to him. And finally, after playing around with uh, session cookies and playing around with CSRF token, uh, there is a point where it realizes that, okay, I'm gonna do this in only one step. So it creates this bash example, with first access to the login page, retrieves the session cookie and the CSRF token to have that um, updated. And then for that point, uses that to log in into the application with the provided credentials. And finally, if you can see here, we access to the, to the application. Okay, so we are now the, this, this user winner with this session. Okay, so now the next point is trying to upload the web shell. So it will try to go and uh, create a PHP file. It fails, we, we are getting some errors here in the output, as you can see here, like PHP files are not upload. So then tries again with a double extension. If we go and scroll a bit, we can see that eventually we'll try with another extension, PHTML. And then finally, sorry? Oh yeah, sorry. And after that, um, we see, which is really, really important and interesting, is that uh, it tries to upload an HT access. In this case, what it's trying to do is, is trying to uh, get any image file that can ex execute PHP code. Uh, and I ask you here, how many times we were doing like a pen test and maybe we forgot of doing or trying these kind of things like loading an HT access to see if we can replace that and we can execute uh, PHP code in an image file, which uh, the, at the beginning was, was filtered. And yeah, after that, it just uh, access to the application. It tries a, a couple of times. Sorry for doing a scroll, but I don't want to waste too much time, much, much time in this. So eventually, um, let's go to the final one. Yeah, here we can see that uh, after uploading the, the, the PHP file, you can execute uh, this command, access to the secret key, and then submitting into the submit solution, which is over here, we can get the flag. So something interesting about all these cases is that the AI is also being able to take goals like exfiltrating this file and submitting the, the secret to the endpoint to get the flag. All these kind of details are things that we are not used to seeing any tool or even if we want to test some particular functions of our web application. That's also super interesting to see and is able to manage. So um, now the last example that we're going to see uh, now after, and then after that we're going to see some experiments that we have done, is uh, this is a super interesting case because we have provided no goal to the AI in this case. We are going to see that we are going just to present a typical random text as in any CTF that makes no sense and just confuse you, um, the target. And the AI will start exploring the web application and trying to pursue that goal, right? Because since it doesn't have a goal, it needs to find out what to do and how to hack the website. 
So let's go to the challenge. Let's refresh this. And as you can see, the description is saggy quack quack, try to quack me. That makes no sense. And any of us doing a CTF will be like confused. And we also get some information about the target. Based on that, uh, the agent understands that this is a CTF description and proceeds to go and start doing some recon on the web application. So first of all, access to the root, then to a login website, and notice that there is some JavaScript file. So decide to go and analyze the JavaScript all by itself. We're going to see this, uh, this behavior is repeated in, during the whole trace because every time that it's detecting a new JavaScript, it's reading and understanding that file to improve the knowledge about the application and keep digging deeper until it finds some particular goal to exploit. So once it learns about uh, the login, it's going to try to uh, test some test test user as we always do while doing a pen test to see how it behaves. Of course, it doesn't work, but the application understands that the login is working. So after that, it tries some basic payloads for SQL injection. Doesn't work neither. We get the same message. And now we craft just a quick Python script to do some default credentials for the admin user, just trying some few well-known passwords to see if anything of that is a like, low-hanging fruit that can get quickly. None of them work, of course. So it decides to move on and try no SQL injection against the login. Doesn't have lag any, anymore. So decides to just try some JSON uh, parameter injection to see if also can get some unexpected behavior on the application. It didn't work either. So now it decides to go to their initial recon and say, okay, let's see what other endpoints we have. And it realized that there was one endpoint called post create. When it tried to access this endpoint, it realized that it requires authentication. And in this application, the main feature is that users can create posts, like in any social media. So it decides to go and go to the endpoint for register an account. Again, as we have seen in other examples, it's going to access the endpoint, read the JavaScript file, understand how the form works to register a user, and it's going to try to register a test user. This works, and the user is registered. So now we move on to, again, use those credentials and keep act getting more access to the application and perform some authenticated tests. If we scroll a little bit down, we are going to see now that it tries to access again to this endpoint, providing the cookies. Um, this endpoint works, retrieves a JavaScript file, gets more information about the application, and now decides just to do a simple um, post, like we always do, like we're just in the website, we want to learn how to, the application behaves. So this works, it creates a post. So now it knows, based on everything that has read from the HTML and JavaScript files, that all the posts can be accessed on this endpoint for the test user. So when it access, we can see here the, 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 the post being printed. And, but also, if we pay attention, we are going to see that there is a report to admin feature that there is a little bottom here. And this is super interesting because now is the AI realizing that there is a report to admin feature and it has found a potential attack vector. At this point, we didn't have any goal, but now the AI, under, I understand that there is an admin user that could potentially be reviewing the reports, so it decides to go ahead and try some exploits on payloads to see if it can force any type of interaction. Remember that this is a CTF, so it's expecting to have something to leak or to exploit in order to retrieve the flag. So once it learns how it works based on the JavaScript, it's going to just do a report uh, of, this ex uh, of this case to see if it works, it works. So now it decides to start collecting more information for the one of the final payloads and creates a super interesting script because in this case it's taking care of everything. It's creating a new user, it's reusing those credentials to log in, in the application, then grabbing the cookie, setting a payload for a client-side exploit to try to send some fetch requests to our collaboration server. Another interesting case that is understand what the collaboration server is and how to use it, how to interact with it and use the payloads. And then we'll create just the post trigger the report, and then wait for some interactions. Of course, it's five seconds because it's a CTF. We expect some kind of quick interaction in this case. Again, it tries a different payload to see if it can trigger any interaction. The 
something interesting here is that it's not creating the user anymore because they understand that they already have this. So it removes that part from the script and keep improving it to make better results. Doesn't work neither. So it goes on, try one more time with a different payload. And again, sending the, the DOM of the application uh, for the admin user, it sends it, and after that, it gets that interaction on the interact SH server that we have. And it's super interesting to see that it understands that this is an interaction for an admin that has access to the website and is able to retrieve the whole DOM of the application. And if we try to search for the flag, oops, well, like the flag, we are going to see that all this here is URL encoded, but this is the flag that has exfiltrated from the DOM of the admin user. With that, the AI understands that this, the challenge has successfully finished and has everything it needs to complete the challenge. So, too many examples and too many scrolling. So now let's jump to something different, a different experiment we did, and is to know if can AI be compared to human pen testers. So for this, we did an experiment that you may have seen in the in internet, that we published some of the results. And here on the screen, you are going to see both uh, terminals. One, one screenshot is the pen tester working, and the other one is the AI working at the same time, trying to solve the same challenge. Uh, something interesting about this case is that you're going to see images, because now we have built in a new browser uh, for the AI, so it can understand buttons, everything, and more JavaScript application based, so it improved the results a lot on the client-side applications. And if you keep tracking the numbers, uh, you are going to see that after the AI finish in four minutes, the pen tester is still struggling like 20 minutes more to exploit this uh, vulnerability and this challenge. So for this, we hire five pen testers from different companies, going from junior to principal, uh, we gave them 40 hours to solve all of the validation cases that they were able to solve from our validation set. They could use any tools, no exceptions. Uh, they could do whatever they want, just a real CTF. Um, the thing is that, uh, well, I'm just going to let it continue just a few seconds so you can see how the AI has finished and the pen tester is still working on the challenge up to uh, these 19 minutes approximately. So. The results from, from this experiment were quite interesting and let us understand much more of how these things work and how it can be applied to our field. So on this chart, you can see how the Expo um, behave, uh, obtain the same results as a principal, both solving the 85% of this challenge from the validation set. And on the other chart, you can see their resolutions, percentage made by difficulty. And if you pay attention to the easy and medium, you are going to see that the AI excels the, the, the human pen tester and performs better results. However, as we, Diego was mentioned before, for the hard challenges, the AI is struggling a little bit more. And those, client, those cases that require more creativity, alternative thinking, or more careful process, uh, the human excels in those cases. So this gives us a, a huge hint about how this can be applied to our field. Where, where we can imagine a, a place where the AI is taking care of all the, those things that are less interesting for us and leaving the human experts the work of working on the more exciting parts of or more challenging parts of the application. Okay. And now we go to our last question for, for today. So um, can AI actually be our second brain or assistant? So we know that uh, AI has been uh, very used in multiple contexts, but we haven't seen before like how we can use the AI to assist uh, as a pen tester or back hunter in this case, all the people are, are interested in here. So for this meaning, we, we use um, uh, something called human in the loop. We have been talking about uh, before. So here we have a prototype in what we can, wanted to do is basically analyze how we can use AI to, to perform better uh, the, the, the work of the human, okay? So yeah, here is a, a small video, uh, which just let it, let it run. Uh, but basically uh, what we wanted to create, it was a prototype that basically will provide some goals. Uh, um, uh, apart from that goal, 
uh, what we can do is uh, provide some feedback to the AI so we can change the workflow and how it works. So for example, if we are analyzing how the AI is performing and what kind of stuff it is trying to do, we can go in the middle and we can try and change uh, that, that workflow. So for example, if we see that it's trying to execute a command that it's bad, we can modify that and let the, the AI interact and continue with that. Also, if we see that, for example, it's missing, um, it's trying to exploit an SQL injection, and we see that it's missing some payloads or it's missing some entry points, we can also provide that as part, as part of the learnings, and we can, okay, say, say to the AI that he has to be and follow that, that right path. So this is just a prototype, an example. This is not something that we are presenting to, to, to sell or everything like that. We just wanted to, to see how we can interact with, with, uh, with the human in the loop. So let's skip this one. Okay, and now to sum, to sum up, um, we, we're gonna be uh, reviewing again uh, the three questions that we have been talking uh, before. So for the first question of all, um, if we can uh, mimic human back hunters, Okay, we have seen that uh, the AI is surprisingly good for, for some examples, especially the, the easy ones and the medium ones, but depending on the difficulty, we have to uh, improve the, the performance. Then, um, talking about uh, if we can compare human pen testers to AI, uh, as Joel was talking before, ex um, expert human excels at creativity and are really, really good at hard challenges. Um, but, but yeah, uh, the AI is faster and better. We, we saw in the example that we provide like uh, five pen testers, we gave them like 40 hours, and uh, the AI was able to solve all of them in just 30 minutes. And if we talk about uh, if the AI can be our second brain or assistant, this is something that we, we need to uh, try together. So uh, we will be sharing some stuff in our websites in the, in the a couple of weeks. So just we can go there to expo.com, you can join the waitlist, and we will be sharing everything over there and also in our social media. So just keep a, an eye on that. And finally, we don't want to forget about the team. This is not something that we have done ourselves. This is an effort of all the Expo team. So a big shout out to all, all of them because we have been working hard these three last months. And, and yeah, this is something that we have done all together. And yeah, that's uh, the end of the talk. Again, thank you to DEFCON and the Back Bounty Village for giving us the opportunity. And we have some questions if, if you want. Uh, not sure. If, I'm not sure if we have the mic, so we just. So so far, everything has been done under control and environment control environment. We are not yet using this to do bug bounties. We are trying to test this to be used to test how to understand how this could be used in the bug bounty field and in the security field. So, so far there is not a monetary search for this now, it's just this, uh, what we have shared, yeah. Yes. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, we have tried. Probably those are into, if I remember correctly, into misconfigurations or uh, category. Uh, but we have tried the uh, headers, manipulation, and malformation. Uh, we have a few challenges of those. I can maybe look for the results if after the talk if you want. Yeah. Yes. So for, for the first question, it's um, depending on how you set the goal, it's very persistent. For example, we saw the cross-site scripting that was trying, keeping trying, then doing something that we also do kind of human thing is like going and looking around to see if we can find another hints or something to get into the, the feedback, but then goes back to the goal that's very persistent into that. In terms of technical details, it's like you can set the amount of interactions that you want to spend so you don't have like an infinite loop of things trying out. And the second question was uh, to protect. So now is everything run in an isolated environment and protected, so we are working on improving that in order to they be conscious about what it's doing and running, and that's, that's also taking into account all the sales force that it has to do while testing application. 
So one more, <laughs> there we go, you are quicker. <laughs> Thank you. So, when it comes to identifying challenges in the difference between the uh, skills and the challenges, have you done an analysis of like what the limitations are in terms of like skills among those that have been announced? Like, are they able to take that part now? Do you think that's just like one more thing? Yeah, the thing is that as in, if you gonna, you have played CTF, when you go to hard challenges, it's like you have to maybe change too many things together. You have to, so probably the AI is get, being able to detect the first two vectors, but then it doesn't go farther and detects the final one that is giving you the flag. So that would, for us is a known solution. Uh, even though it found valid endpoints and it started exploiting vulnerabilities, if it doesn't get the flag, it's a no, no, no resolution for us. So probably, the creativity and the, and the effort that can put in human and into going to so deep, that's what makes the difference for now, at least, yeah. Yeah, I oh, oh, so I think we have no more time for questions, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone.